On his journey to the moon, Mitchell conducted a private ESP or extrasensory perception experiment attempting to send mental images back to Earth using a set of cards. The results, scored by colleagues back on Earth, were better than chance. Mitchell wasn't shy about this. In a 1971 New York Times interview, he said, we're too much uninformed about telepathy or ESP to project its uses. But I think once we understand the mechanism, then we can start talking about uses. Few at NASA were interested, except one. Werner von Braun. War is a dirty business, and all I can say is that I'm happy that it's all over now. Yes, that von Braun, former Nazi and father of American rocketry. He was, according to Mitchell, deeply supportive, even encouraging Mitchell to find a site within NASA to study consciousness further. After his mission, Mitchell founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences, a think tank dedicated to consciousness, psychic phenomena, and metaphysics. Von Braun attended one of its early fundraising dinners. For Mitchell, the overview effect, seeing Earth from space, was spiritual. It made him wonder if the entire cosmos might be conscious, and he wasn't alone. There I was, and there you are. There you are, the Earth, dynamic, overwhelming, and I felt that the world is just, there's too much purpose, too much logic. It was just too beautiful to happen by accident. There has to be somebody bigger than you and bigger than me. And, and I mean this in a spiritual sense, not a religious sense. There has to be a creator of the universe who stands above the religions that we ourselves create to govern our lives. From the early days of rocketry to the height of the Apollo program, there's been a long tradition of visionary scientists who saw no contradiction between physics and mysticism. Even today, the pattern continues. They're using the images of Roman gods, and I would ask them, I said, why are you using the images of Roman gods? Why are you putting them on your mission patches and also utilizing Latin phrases from that time period? I mean, you're sending it up into space. Is Who up in space is gonna read Latin? And his answer was, our sponsors. Behind rocket technology, the thrust, the telemetry, the hardware, there is something else, something older. There are whispers and subtle acknowledgments to gods, ancient symbols, rituals, and perhaps even the influence of non-human intelligence. And if that is true, or at least if people involved in this science believe it to be true, then we need to ask the fundamental question, what is rocket science really? Is it foundationally entangled in something very strange we've spent millennia trying to understand? Are there strange forces helping us get off this planet? So buckle up, alchemists, because this one is going way out there. When we think about the moon landing, the rockets, the computers, the broadcasts sent across 230,000 miles of empty space, it's easy to forget how recent this kind of knowledge really is. Just over a century ago, astronomers were still debating the basic structure of the universe. Einstein had shaken the foundations of physics in 1915 with his general theory of relativity. But when it came to the cosmos itself, even the experts weren't sure what they were actually looking at through their telescopes. Then in 1923, Edwin Hubble peered through the 100-inch Hooker telescope at Mount Wilson Observatory and saw something staggering. This new telescope was powerful enough to resolve individual stars inside what most had assumed was just a cloud of gas in our own galaxy. Guess what? It wasn't. That cloud, Andromeda, was another galaxy entirely, millions of light years away. This discovery shattered the old view. Our Milky Way wasn't the whole universe. It was just one among many. It changed the cosmic perspective of the 20th century in the same way Copernicus had centuries earlier 
when he removed the Earth from the center of the solar system. And the man who built this observatory that made this discovery possible was one of the most important and strangest figures in the history of modern astronomy. I bring you George Ellery Hale. Hale wasn't just a brilliant physicist, he was a visionary, and in some ways, a mystic. While still at MIT, he invented the spectroheliograph, a device that could capture solar flares erupting from the sun's surface. But Hale's fascination with the sun went far beyond science. He saw astronomy as a kind of philosophy, a link back to ancient Greece, Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Babylon. He founded multiple observatories, including Mount Wilson in Pasadena. The lodges where astronomers stayed were reportedly decorated with Egyptian hieroglyphs and symbols, a reminder that they weren't just studying the stars, they were joining a tradition as old as human civilization. Then there's the stranger part. Hale claimed he received creative inspiration from a being, an elf or a spirit as he described it. Some biographers wrote this off as stress, eccentricity, or mistranslation. But what if it wasn't? Hale certainly wasn't the first or the last brilliant scientist to feel like he was receiving messages from somewhere else. His reverence for the sun wasn't just theoretical. When he designed the Hale Solar Laboratory in Pasadena, he included a tribute to Ankh Aten in the arch above the entrance, the ancient Egyptian pharaoh who tried to replace the entire Egyptian pantheon with a single god, Aten the sun disk. When Hale died, his obituaries called him a priest of the sun, a modern Zoroaster. You might think Hale's beliefs were just personal quirks, unrelated to his science, but this fits a much larger pattern. Throughout history, the people we celebrate for pure science, the mathematicians, the engineers, the astronomers, were often described as tapping into something else something they themselves called mystical, spiritual, or supernatural. Today, we like to separate the discovery from the discoverer. We want breakthroughs to feel rational, mechanical, explainable, but that doesn't erase the fact that many of those breakthroughs were made by people who believed they were channeling something deeper. Back in the early 20th century, Hale's work to help lay the foundations for modern astronomy. But his influence didn't stop with telescopes. He also transformed a small technical school, Throop Polytechnic, into what would become a powerhouse of science and engineering, Caltech. By the 1930s, Caltech was more than just a hub for equations and experiments. It became a magnet for the greatest minds on Earth. Hubble, Bohr, Oppenheimer, Heisenberg, even Einstein passed through its halls. But Caltech also attracted outsiders. One of them wasn't even a student, but he would end up reshaping the future of American rocketry and possibly opening a door to something far stranger. Jack Parsons. John Whiteside Parsons, Jack, to his friends, was born in Pasadena in 1914. From an early age, he was hooked on science fiction. He struggled in school and never earned a formal degree, but that didn't matter. Parsons had an intuitive genius for chemistry and propulsion. As a teenager, he and his friend Ed Foreman built homemade rockets, scavenging parts from Foreman's father's workshop. One classmate later described them as a couple of powder monkeys going out into the desert, blowing things up. Jack's mother, worried about his obsession with explosives, sent him to military school. He was expelled after he blew up a toilet block. Nothing deterred him. Parsons had one dream, to build a machine that could reach the moon. By the early 1930s, he and Foreman were sneaking onto the Caltech campus to meet like-minded students who believed in rocketry. Just a few years earlier, a Caltech student named Thomas Townsend Brown had formulated a less crude version of space travel. But that fell upon deaf ears with top physics professors at Caltech like Robert Milliken. Parsons was able to gain much more traction, 
He found an ally in Frank Molina, an engineering student working under Theodore von Karman, one of the sharpest minds in aerodynamics. Together, they formed an informal rocketry group and began testing experimental engines in the Arroyo Seco, a dry gulch just outside Pasadena. That site would later become Jet Propulsion Laboratory, JPL. Now here's something a lot of people don't realize. At about 24 miles altitude, the first stage breaks away and the second stage motors fire. In the early 20th century, even some of the most respected physicists believed rockets wouldn't work in space. One of them, Caltech's own Fritz Zwicky, the man who coined the term supernova and theorized dark matter, dismissed the idea as nonsense. They misunderstood Newton. They thought rockets needed something to push against, and in the vacuum of space, there would be nothing to push on. Even the New York Times mocked the idea in a 1920 editorial. So when people like Jack Parsons pursued this, they weren't solving a hard problem. They were chasing what many thought was a delusion. That makes what they achieved all the more remarkable. They believed in the impossible, then figured out how to build it. And Parsons, as we'll see, believed in more than just exotic propulsion. At Caltech, his raw intuition led to breakthroughs in both solid and liquid fuels, more powerful and reliable than anything that had come before. The tests were chaotic and dangerous, but soon the military took notice. Parsons developed a solid fuel booster, or what would later become the first stage of a rocket, to help heavily loaded aircraft take off. They called it Jet Assisted Takeoff, or JADO. They avoided using the word rocket because it still sounded too much like science fiction. The first successful JADO flight was in 1941. By 1942, the US military was ordering 20,000 units per month. But just as JPL was taking off, the FBI came knocking because Jack Parsons wasn't just a rocket scientist. He was also a practicing occultist. He was a devoted member of the Ordo Templi Orientis, or OTO, an esoteric order led at the time by the infamous Aleister Crowley. Thelema, their belief system, combined ceremonial magic, Eastern mysticism, and tantric techniques into what Crowley called sex magic. That's magic with a K to distinguish it from stage tricks. Parsons wasn't just a casual participant. He led the local chapter from a Pasadena mansion where he lived with a rotating cast of artists, intellectuals, and magicians. The rituals were elaborate, invoking gods, spirits, and forces said to reside in higher dimensions. The most infamous of these was the Babylon working an attempt to summon the divine feminine archetype known as Babylon. Inspired by Crowley's novel, Moonchild, the ritual aimed to recreate a magical child through spiritual and sexual practices, not literal birth, but transformation of the self. 